You're watching Cybersecurity Inside, a video cast where you can discover what you need to know about cybersecurity. Here are your hosts, Tom Garrison and Camille Moorhart. Our guest today is Karen Elizari. She is a security researcher, author, and TED speaker, and an industry analyst. She is co-founder of Besides Tel Aviv, Israel's largest hacker community event since 2016 and founder of Leading Cyber Ladies. Welcome to the podcast, Karen. Thank you. It's so fantastic to be on the show. I appreciate the invitation and the chance to share my point of view. So thanks for having me. This is going to be fun because our listeners don't know this, but obviously we do, that you have a sister that works with us here at Intel, and that's how we actually came in contact with each other. Yes, and I'm so proud of my illustrious sister, Dr. Amita Lazari. She also has one more academic degree than I do. She's the first doctor in our family, so we're very proud of her. Not a medical doctor, but rather a juris doctor, a doctor of law. And I'm very yes. proud of her work with Intel. But you are incredible as well, and we want to talk about your background. I know you got started very early in, the, in sort of the interest in cybersecurity, and I think this is where we want to at least start our conversation. There's a lot we're going to try to cover in our time together, but you have a kind of a non-traditional foray into cybersecurity, and I thought it'd be great to start there. So I first became fascinated with technology and computers from a very young age. Probably when I was 10 or 11, I was already using the computer in our school's library. I was lucky to have a school that had a computer room. We even had a robotics lab, and that was really ahead of its time in the early 90s here in Israel. I was very lucky to have access to that kind of technology, and I was really inspired and curious about this technology. And I spent a lot of time wondering about the many questions that I had. In fact, as a girl, instead of a bedtime story, I would read the encyclopedia. True story. That's how much of a nerd I am. I had so many burning questions that when we first received access to the internet in Israel, which happened around 1993, it was amazing. It was like the world's largest encyclopedia and never ending encyclopedia. Now, Wikipedia didn't exist back then and neither did Google, by the way. So it was really about teaching myself how the World Wide Web worked so that I could find answers to my many, many questions. And sometimes those answers were on password protected websites or they were on all sorts of curious databases and in other words, on other people's computers. So I had to teach myself how to access all of that information. And to me, it wasn't a criminal act. It was a really passion, curiosity. I never for once realized that what I was doing could be illegal or wrong. And in fact, it wasn't because we didn't have a computer crime law in Israel until 1999. But that point aside, I was really discovering and learning everything I could about this digital world. And I was teaching myself how to do it until a moment in my life that changed my life forever in 1995, where I met my first hacker mentor. That's when I knew that all of my activities, my passions and my curiosity is actually called being a hacker and that you could be pretty cool and be a hacker. And her name is Angelina Jolie because she portrayed the fierce high school hacker Acid Burn in a Hollywood movie that captured my heart and my imagination and changed my life. In fact, I want to show you something. So I have the soundtrack right here. It's a CD, digital CD format. I don't know if uh, you remember this format. It's how we used to listen to music. <laughs> Do um, I remember a CD? Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, some of the people listening to the podcast or watching us might not know this, but this is how we used to listen to music. You'd have to go to the store and buy it. And if you just take a look at the cast of characters here, it really caught my imagination because it wasn't just about Angelina Jolie, who was so cool. It was a really diverse cast. It was a group of people that represented hackers, but they looked like all kinds of people. And it really, really captured my imagination that high school kids could become the heroes of their own story through hacking. So that's when I really realized this is what I am. This is what I want to become. This is the world I belong in. It's the world of hackers. So thanks to Hollywood and thanks to the imagination behind this film, I chose a career and a life path in the cybersecurity realm. 
I think you might be the first person who who claims Angelina Jolie as their cybersecurity mentor. And I think part of what also captured at least my attention was when you were talking about the diversity of people that were in this group. Yes, and spoiler alert, Tom, the hackers are not the bad guys. Those high school kids end up saving the day. Let's carry forward in your stories. Some people may not realize this. In Israel, there's compulsory military duty. And so maybe we can pick up the story when you got to your service. Because of the movie, I doubled down on any computer education I had access to in school and high school. Uh, and just before my military service, I had a couple of months just after finishing high school and before my draft, my mandatory draft. And I started a job at the local computer store. And one day a bunch of kids came in and they were buying, they asked for something called a jumper. Now, I know you know what a jumper is, Tom, but for those who who don't know it, at least here in Israel, people used it to modify their motherboard and to actually get the CPU to run faster. It's what we used to call overclocking. And uh, I know that Intel uh, in the past may have frowned upon it, but now a lot of people think about uh, how we, they can overpower their CPUs. Yeah, right? no, we have a whole set of CPUs now that are designed specifically for overclockers. So yeah, we've embraced it. So I thought it was the coolest thing ever because when those kids showed up and they asked me for those little plastic pieces and I asked them, what are you going to do with these? And they said, well, we're going to make our computers run faster. I was really, really interested because I knew about, you know, hacking in the digital realm in the World Wide Web and I knew, I knew a little bit about network security, but I didn't know a lot about hardware hacking and modifying technology. And so I learned from these kids and they took me to my first hacker convention. And that was just a year before my military service began. And I remember showing up to that first ever hacker convention in Tel Aviv in Israel. And it was about 300 guys and me and the woman who was organizing the conference. And thanks to, to that woman, I felt like, okay, Maybe I do belong here, even though I didn't see any other young women or girls around, but I saw so many interesting people and I could just learn from them. And I realized this hacking thing that I'm into, it's not just in the internet, it's not just in Hollywood, there's hackers right here in Israel. And a few weeks after that is when I was drafted to the military. So on draft day, you show up, you get your uniform, you get your shots, you get your picture taken, you, you get very uncomfortable boots. And then you, at least I was, sent into a small room with a stern looking officer who had a pile this big of files and folders on their table with all the information about all the kids who were coming in that day, all the kids who turned 18 and were drafted. And that officer kind of find my file out of the pile of hundreds and says, oh, okay, Karen, uh, what's your story, Karen De Lazari? And in one sentence, I looked at him and I said, I want to be a hacker. This is what I want to do for the army. And this is what I know. I'm curious about hacking. I've spent a couple of years exploring. This is what I would love to do for the military if you gave me a chance. And that was 21 years ago. So I was really lucky, I think, to be there in that point in time, turn of the millennia where digital technology was a big part of the military. It wasn't as big as it is today, but cybersecurity was already something that the military was thinking about. And that recruitment officer, whilst not being a technology expert or a cybersecurity expert, they responded to what I had to say. They said, okay, a hacker, I think I know what I'm gonna do with you. And he sent me to the communication security department within the military intelligence branch. So he actually sent me to the relevant unit. And, you know, that's remarkable because it's a system that, you know, churns through people all the time and you don't always get people, don't always get the assignment that they want. And it can be frustrating. But for me, it was an extremely eye opening experience because for the first time I could use my tricks and my curiosity and my hacker mindset, but I had to learn how to use it within a military methodology. And I had to learn how to use it to protect systems and not just to break things. Because I was pretty much, I was much better at breaking things and poking holes in systems than I was at building secure systems. And through the military service, I had to practice both of those mindsets, the red team and the blue team, if you will. That's something that we talk a lot about in the security space, red team and blue team. So the military service really forced me to embrace both of these perspectives. And it taught me so much about the different technologies that a huge organization uses 
to deploy people in the physical realm, but how much the digital realm is what they rely on. So it was an incredibly transformative experience for me. And I would also add, it was quite equalizing because as a woman, I was serving with other young men and women. And it wasn't about my gender in that particular role. It was just about the talent and the passion that everybody could bring to the job. And oftentimes I would be the only woman in the room or the youngest person in the room or both. I believe that through my passion for technology, I was able to overcome those odds as it were and present a point of view that hacking is valuable and the hacker mindset is valuable. So I was very thankful to have had a positive experience throughout my service. And I think it's, um, it's quite a unique situation that we have here in my country. Although, of course, I would prefer it if we didn't have to have an army at all. But that's a story for a different conversation. That you were one of uh, just a very few uh, females that was, was going through this. Did you see a change in, in terms of, you know, young girls or young women that were getting into hacking and cybersecurity in general over your time? Absolutely. You know, I have more than 25 years of a perspective in the cybersecurity world. So the days of that hacking event that I was, I was the only girl there, those days have absolutely changed. And I should also note that throughout my career, after my military service and working with a variety of huge technology companies, including AT&T and PricewaterhouseCoopers and very big Israeli technology companies, the only time I had a female boss was in my military service. So actually, in a sense, that part of my life was even ahead of its time. Nowadays, I see women all across different positions in cybersecurity, whether it's entry level positions, students at Tel Aviv University, where I'm a researcher, or at different parts of our uh, community with B-sides, and of course, with the leading cyber ladies community, I see women all across the cybersecurity realm. So it, the picture has absolutely changed. I am hopeful that the situation we see here in Israel with about 25 or 30 percent representation of women within the security industry is one that we'll see around the world, hopefully leading up to gender equality and 50 percent representation, which should be the ideal. But of course, there's no perfect. Nothing is perfect in life. But I've absolutely seen a change to your question in 25 years. Ladies, gentlemen, I can tell you the picture has changed. It's a very diverse worldview right now. Is there a way to actually teach hacking or is it something that you have to evolve the skill for on your own by discovery? That's a fabulous question, Camille, and one I'm asked often. In fact, one of the most frequent questions on my talks and speaking engagements is, where is the friendly hacker school? Where do I sign up to become a friendly hacker? So I think there is a combination of things. One is certainly there is a mindset, and I was either born or it was nurtured in me from an early age to have the very curious mindset, the one that keeps asking questions, the one that is interested in taking things apart to understand how they work, the one that's not afraid to poke a finger in a hole or a vulnerability and see what happens and unravel that thread. That's the hacker mindset. And that's something I kind of always had with me. So I didn't necessarily learn it anywhere. Maybe I somehow received it by osmosis from my environment, perhaps. But there are ways to cultivate that mindset, the curiosity, the creativity that comes with the hacker mindset. I think there are ways to artificially cultivate that. Certainly with a younger age group, you could cultivate that with games, with puzzles, with mystery challenges. Even a library could be, you know, an incredible place to explore and identify things. The second part of it is the technical side, and that's certainly something that you can learn and that you must learn. In fact, I have to spend some time each day learning about the latest technologies, the latest threats, the latest techniques that cyber criminals are using. So the learning aspect of the technical element is an ongoing journey. And that's certainly something that you can learn and that there are many uh, types of programs and certificates and diplomas that one could take. But I would start with the curiosity and the hacker mindset, the approach, which is not necessarily tied into the technical realm, but it's something that I think we can cultivate. Do you focus on the type of system that you're interested in hacking, or are you looking more at like, I'm going to pick software or hardware, or I'm going to pick physical attack or remote attack? 
So I think there's a challenge there, which is you have to know what's possible in order to choose a particular path or particular specialty. So it's a little bit kind of like the field of medicine, which is, of course, vast and different. But in the world of medicine, you could be a general doctor or you could have a specialization. And in order to reach that phase in your career as a doctor where you choose to become an eye doctor or a children's doctor or a surgeon, any other type of doctor, you are exposed to different types of medical practices. And then, you know, something probably calls out to you or you make the choice because you see there's not a lot of people practicing that kind of medicine in your community. So it's required, it's needed, and you choose that. In the security world and the hacker world, I believe in showcasing the different aspects, which is why events like B-Sides, which is part of a global community, are so important because people can be exposed to the different aspects in the hacking world and the cybersecurity world, from hardware hacking to application security, to networks and communications, to cryptography, to cloud. There, there are so many specialties that one could follow. I recommend if somebody was asking me, how do I choose a specialty? I would recommend spending some time, even if it's a day or two, immersing yourself in each of these different disciplines and just finding what speaks to you, what grabs your attention. I was always really intrigued by network security and communications. That was kind of like my forte, the area that really captured my imagination. But that's not to say that over a few years, I also developed an interest in cryptography and other aspects of the security world, like vulnerability management. So. It really is up to you or up to the listeners, I imagine, to spend some time. I'm a really big believer in experience and learning through experience. So spending some time in each of these areas, whether it's through a conference, a workshop, taking an online course, reading an article and seeing what speaks to you so that you can choose a path. So Karen, you've been spending time, you said teaching. I'm wondering if you could share with us, like, what, what are you teaching there in Israel, and where are your sort of passions on teaching taking you? So for the past few years, I had a research project at Tel Aviv University where I focused on the value of bug bounty programs, otherwise known as vulnerability disclosure programs. These are programs that allow companies as big as Intel and as small as innovative startups to work with individual hackers from all over the world. And I've been really following the bug bounty phenomena closely for the past six years. And through my research grant, I was able to show that these programs provide incredible value, not just in the economical sense of dollar value per vulnerability identified, where still in many cases, these programs tend to offer incredible efficiency if you contrast the amount of vulnerabilities and how critical those vulnerabilities are with the amount of money that companies end up paying to the researchers. So certainly established that it's a very efficient means of discovering vulnerabilities and bugs, but there's also other forms of value, like the reputational value for the company as being known as a company that collaborates with hackers, the reputational value for the hackers who build their name and their brand on bug bounty platform and often become role models and mentors for other hackers and other forms of value as well that ultimately, I believe, raise up the entire level of the security ecosystem. So I do believe that we need all the help we can get at security as a team sport. It's not one that's just up to a government agency or a technology company to solve on their own. And my vision for the security world is one of a digital immune system where hackers play their part by helping us identify vulnerabilities. And even the malicious hackers, even cyber criminals, help us evolve because they force us to demand better, to develop better technology and to change our dependencies. So that's my overall vision in, in terms of my research and my teaching. Now, in the next year, I'm going to start a new course at Reichman University, which is Israel's latest and newest private university. And this is specifically a course that's designed for master's students that are in management and legal professions. So it's not for a tech audience. It's actually for students in management positions. And it's all about the changes in the security world that they have to understand in terms of new regulations that are coming in, digital transformation trends and what they mean from the security perspective, learning about how to work with hackers through vulnerability disclosure programs and how the personal household has also become an arena for cybersecurity decisions. So this is a course that's really designed for 
any type of executive really. And I'm really, really excited to get it started with this new, new university here in Israel. So in terms of my vision, I think you can read between the lines. I'm a really big believer in the power of community. That's why I started Besides Tel Aviv and the Leading Cyber Ladies. That's why I dedicate so much of my time to speaking engagements and to interviews and media projects and to working with all kinds of people in our world. I am so passionate about cybersecurity and I want to share that passion with everyone because I think it's become something that's vital. It's critical for our day of life and it's not something that can be left for nerds and geeks or government agencies. It's something that all of us have to be passionate about. So that's my vision. I hope that doesn't sound too grand. It's about sharing my stories and sharing my passion about cybersecurity with everybody and making the field more accessible. Can you just give us like there what's one trend that you were surprised that you think is here now and you didn't expect to see it? So ransomware did not surprise me. Ransomware becoming such a valuable criminal tool. In fact, probably the most lucrative form of cybercrime right now. That did not surprise me because I've been tracking ransomware for more than five or six years. Some of you might still remember the one of the first major ransomware cases that was discussed was on a hospital in California, a Hollywood Presbyterian hospital. So what surprised me, though, is that throughout the pandemic and throughout COVID-19, criminal groups were so unscrupulous as to attack hospitals and healthcare providers specifically. So that's something that surprised me. And I shouldn't be surprised by cyber criminals because they go after where the money is and they really don't have a, a moral code or any ethics to speak of. But the fact that throughout the pandemic that impacted everybody around the world, they would still go after healthcare providers and hospitals. That to me was really jarring. Now, to, to build on top of that, we have to look at what criminals are doing because they have really used the past 18 months, the past pandemic year and a half, as an opportunity to reinvent themselves. So they've come up with new business models. There's ransomware as a service now. So ransomware as a service where some ransomware operators partner with distributors and affiliates that make sure that the ransomware gets delivered, but there's just a vast ecosystem of players within that. There's uh, the ransomware and extortion model. There's faster ransomware. So they in invest so much time and efforts in the development of the technical payload itself so that they can spread faster and encrypt faster. So it's changing every week. And I've been following these trends closely. So I guess that's the, the thing that surprised me it shouldn't surprise me at all. Criminals will be innovating and they will go after the targets that they believe will pay the most. And they have done that throughout the, this pandemic, unfortunately. Do you have a sense this is a winnable battle or the more you get into it, do you get more and more discouraged? So thank you for the question because I was starting to feel depressed by my own messages. <laughs> so that's the challenge I think with cybersecurity. We have to really keep our optimism. Yes, there are elements of this battle that are winnable. However, I've said this before and it's been said by others, cybersecurity and achieving security, it's not a destination. It's not a train that you get on and at the end, I'm secure, I'm done. It's a journey that's continuous and we're going to be on it. It's never going to stop. It's always going to be a cat and mouse. It's always going to be a new vulnerability, a new technical capability, a new criminal business model. So is it winnable? I think that there are ways to make security a sustainable state. There are ways to make a company more secure. There are ways to make our daily lives more secure in a way that's sustainable. It doesn't require you to live in a bunker with you know, offline communications and only communicating via Morse code with a bunch of sheep in the backyard or something like that. I, yes, I think that there is a sustainable way to achieve a secure state. So in that sense, it is winnable. I'm not depressed by the amount of criminals out there because there's also a million friendly hackers out there. I'm not exaggerating. There's literally a million according to the bug bounty platforms. So there are so many friendly hackers out there. There are so many great companies developing new technologies, new products and new paradigms. So it is quite possible to achieve a more secure state. And in fact, it's always darkest before the dawn. So possibly through this pandemic period, we have experienced digital transformation like no other. There's a silver lining, and that is there's a possibility that many people's security posture actually improved. 
So that, that sounds counterintuitive, I know, but I think coming out of this pandemic, we are gonna see different approaches to online authentication, different approaches to a network perimeter, different approaches to managing healthcare data. So we're gonna have a lot of lessons to learn from the pandemic, but the overall trend I believe is a positive one. I know that you do work with the female hacker community and I, I think it'd be great to share some of the work that you're doing specifically there, you know, for people that are maybe interested in becoming hackers or they have kids that might want to be hackers. Um, how, how do they get involved? Firstly, I'm very proud of the leading cyber ladies network that we have started. It started here in Israel, but it's now global and we've got chapters in Europe, in North America and Canada and the United States. And as of November 21 in Japan, in the Pacific region, and we're always starting new chapters and new activities. So if you're interested in joining a leading cyber ladies networking event or meetup, you can check us out online, leadingcyberladies.com. And we're also on all of the social media platforms. Now, I want to recommend that if some, somebody who's listening today, whether they're a, a young woman or a, a person of any age and any gender, really, if you're curious about cybersecurity and you're not sure where to start, I really recommend reaching out to your local community meetup or event, whether it's virtually or in person. I was really inspired by the Security B-Sides movement, which is a network of events for the security community. I started the one in Israel, in Tel Aviv, but there are B-Sides events all around the globe, also available virtually, and they're a great way to make your first step. So take a day or a couple hours out of your week to spend some time with a community meetup like B-Sides, and you'll be exposed to entry-level content, but also more advanced content you'll see companies that are trying to hire hackers you'll see people that you might learn from mentors or your peers so that would be a good first step and even if you have a younger person a child uh, some besides events could be great for bringing your children along with you of course check with them specifically i recommend you look into securitybesides.org that's the website securitybesides.org there are B-Sides events all over the world. In fact, I'm wearing the shirt from B-Sides Tel Aviv 2019, and Intel has been a proud sponsor of B-Sides Tel Aviv since our very first year. So thank you for that. That's great. And for the people who don't have a screen in front of them, it's B as in the letter B, and then sides. Uh, so B-Sides. Yes, that's right. Securitybsides.org is where you'll find the global map of all of the different events around the world. Thank you so much for that, Karen. I'd like to uh, close by our fun little segment that we do on every podcast called Fun Facts. And uh, I know we kind of sprung this on you, but uh, I'm hoping that you have a fun little fact that you would like to share with our listeners. Sure. So my fun fact is about digital currencies and more specifically cryptocurrencies, which some of you know made the scene in 2009 when Bitcoin was invented or the first Bitcoin white paper was published by Satoshi Nakamoto. However, the science fiction author Neil Stevenson imagined cryptocurrencies about 10 or 15 years before Bitcoin was a reality. So he wrote a story for Time magazine in 1995 called The Great Simoleon Caper, which described the world with a digital currency and with some criminals stealing cryptocurrency. And then later on in The Cryptonomicon, a book he wrote in 1999, he described a cryptocurrency in more detail. So that's my fun fact. Cryptocurrencies are not just changing the world, they were also imagined in science fiction, much like the internet, if I may add. Very good. Very cool. Interesting. Camille, how about you? So I've got a fun fact, but before I do that, I want to say we have this complimentary series within Cybersecurity Inside called What That Means. And we have a couple of What That Means episodes on, well, we have one in Cybersecurity Inside also on blockchain. So hitting the cryptocurrency if people want more definitions and conversation around that. And then we also have a What That Means with your sister Amit Elazari and Anahit Tarkanyan on specifically global security policy and security policy within Internet of Things. So that's another one that people can listen to. And I think there was one more I was trying. Oh, yeah. You talk about 
crowdsource security and bug bounty. And we have another episode that goes into detail on what is crowdsource security and bug bounty specifically and how should companies set it up. So just putting that out there for folks if they want more detail. My fun fact is that elephants and whales both communicate on a very low frequency spectrum. Some of it so low that humans can't actually hear it with our own ears. And part of that is so that they can communicate over multiple kilometers at a shot. But one thing that I think is very interesting and I can't confirm is some researchers are looking into whether elephants and whales actually communicate with one another. Wow. That would be awesome. My mind is blown. That's fantastic. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to go into the world of gross for a moment. It turns out that the, a human adult can produce enough saliva to fill a bathtub, not once, but twice in a year. That's an impressive feat. On that low note there, I did want to say it's been great having you on the show. And specifically, I think just what you represent in terms of your energy around cybersecurity, around the idea of being friendly hackers, the role that you play, you know, helping be a leader amongst the female community as well within that group. I think it's great and really appreciate you coming on our podcast and sharing your story. Thank you. And thanks to my sister who convinced me to join the podcast. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Cybersecurity Inside. You can follow us here on YouTube or wherever you get your audio podcasts. The views and opinions expressed are those of the guests and author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Intel Corporation.